I think architects stop at that initial idea. They don't take it any further. And I think that's where we maybe need to grow some balls and diversify. Business of Architecture UK, episode 42. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and what a fabulous day it's been today. We actually had a little bit of sunshine coming out in London that has brought spirit and love to everybody who is walking around today. Maybe this signals the end of the winter months and the beginning of the new dawn of spring. So that's very exciting. I hope you are all well. Um, Before we go into today's podcast, I want to remind you, of course, about the next Business of Architecture UK live event, which is happening on the 5th of March at the wonderful, beautiful You and I offices in Victoria, that 7A Hoek place. And the theme of the evening is the seven threats or how to navigate your way through the seven most common obstacles to an architecture business. Now, we've got a distinguished guest panel speaking about how they have grown their businesses from startup phase right through to um, large operating practices. We've got David West of Egray West. They're a practice of around 40, 50 people working on master planning, regeneration schemes. We've got Hazel Rounding of Shed. She's seen Shed grow from the beginnings when it was like an offshoot of part of Urban Splash to now where they've just got a new office in London. So she's been involved right from the outset pretty much of those. We've got Tara Boladay, the Reba J rising star of 2018, an incredible archipreneur who's already looking at in her you know, first few years of business, how to generate multiple streams of income and revenue and protect her business. Um, we've also got Tim Burgess, who has walked the path of sole practitioner um, through to director of a practice of around 10 people working on a number of multi-million pound projects across London. And of course, the Navy SEALs of business mentors, Johan Taft, will be there. And he has incredible years and years worth of experience working with a multitude of different types of businesses to help them navigate around these seven common obstacles that businesses and architecture practices will often face. Now, tickets are now on sale. If you're quick, the flash sale might still be on, but if you're listening to this a few days afterwards, I'm afraid tickets will have gone back to their regular price. But go and check it out because the flash sale might still be on, depending when you listen to this podcast. So the seven threats to an architecture business tickets are now on sale if you want to know what the seven threats are make sure you are subscribed to our mailing list because i am revealing one of the seven threats each day and also providing a small little tool or resource to help your business be able to tackle and navigate that particular threat ahead of the event so make sure you're on our mailing list if you want to receive those goodies Excellent. Now, on to this week's interview. And this week, I am speaking with the incredible Paul Gallagher of Zap Architecture. Now, Paul is a formidable character. He is a young architect. Zap are a quirky, interesting, exciting, dynamic practice based in, would you believe, a trampoline park in East London, and this trampoline park actually in is inside of a disused Victorian theatre, which Zap actually got hold of. They are the operators of this theatre. They were um, they got involved through a council project, and it is a real interesting and creative environment. Zap have also executed a number of projects in Mayfair and Belgravia and some beautiful house extensions. They've also won a medal at the Chelsea Flower Show for one of their recent garden collaborations that they did there. And in Paul's own words, Paul really has diversified his practice uh, and they're involved in a number of projects. They're currently working on infrastructure, they're working on art installations, um, and they've been involved in a number of a number of other kind of entrepreneurial ventures and I think there really are uh, a lot of things that we can learn and model from this particular way of 
practicing architecture if we have the courage to do so. So without further ado, please sit back and enjoy this week's interview with Paul Gallagher. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I'm here with my very good friend, Paul Gallagher of Zap Architecture. Hi, Ryan. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be on the show. Absolutely. Thanks. Brilliant to be speaking with you after all these years as we yeah. used to work together at uh, Grimshaw Architects, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's um, good fun. Nearly yeah. 10 years ago. Bloody hell, yeah, 10 years so, ago. So yeah. amazing to be in your studio. We're also yeah. above Zap Space, which is one of London's... I don't know if there is any other trampoline parks in London. Inside a Victoria, a hundred-year-old theatre. No, yeah, I don't think there is. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's, it's yeah. amazing. We just had a little a little tour around yeah. that and uh, even did a bit of bouncing. So. Yeah. yeah, it's fun. It's a good way to release stress at lunchtime. It's Love like, it. Yeah. Brilliant. So how, how did you get started then? How did, the, how did ZAP um, architecture as a practice begin? I guess the conventional route was how I began. I graduated from Glasgow School of Art, then Sheffield University. Mm -hmm. Um, from Sheffield, went to Grimshaw's, where we worked together on some very fun projects, infrastructure projects. Um, then from there, I went to Hopkins Architects. Right. Um, while at Hopkins, again, learned from some really good people and really enjoyed cultivating my, I guess, lear earning my stripes with around good people and learning from people. Um, one weekend, me and some friends decided to do a competition, which wasn't unusual for us. We'd, we'd often do competitions mm -hmm. a weekend never expecting to win. It was just something we seen advertised in the Architects Journal. Um, so myself and two friends decided, let's do this competition. It was to design uh, a sculptural entrance to a university in Dublin. Right. But what, what, what attracted us, it was anonymous. So we knew up against the big name firms, it wasn't about your name or your brand. It was about the quality of the, of the proposal. Um, and by some sort of blessing, we won it. Um, Amazing. So that was a lovely phone call to get from the Architects Journal to say, are you Paul? Yeah, by the way, you've won this international competition. And of course, being Irish and the, the project being in Dublin was like, my initial reaction is like, my parents are going to love this because <laughs> they probably don't know what I do day to day. Um, yeah. yeah. So um, This can be something you can actually take them to see as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in Ireland and so now you know what, what your son does. Um, so um, I asked my, my two friends or I guess informal colleagues at the time, let's, let's use this, let's start a practice. Um, they were both doing very well in their uh, respective companies and firms, and still are actually. Um, but they didn't want to have the same gamble kind of philosophy that I did. I thought this was my window to start a practice. Yeah. And I'd never really dreamed of starting a practice, but I thought I'm going. I kind of I tend to go with the wind if if that's the way things are pointing. I think mm. go with it. So started Zap Architecture, um, which was. Um, it was actually requested by the competition uh, client. They said, okay, you've won it, now you've got to build this project, which, if I'm being honest, made me kind of crap myself a little bit. When you say build it, what do, what do you mean? They wanted, so we'd done a competition entry, yeah. which was far, far from an actual detailed design proposal. Right. Um, and the president of the university at the time, who I guess was the client, very encouraging man, he said, look, you've built, you've beat all these international companies established firms he said this is your chance and he, he had a real well wish for me to carry on um he actually kind of facilitated me setting up a company um they organized and helped me get insurance so it, Amazing. Was, it was very much uh, a fatherly hand on the shoulder this is your chance young fellow kind of off yeah you go. um we we weren't completely naive or unprofessional um when i say we it was me actually it was me i wasn't completely naive i partnered with a local dublin firm right for that level of professionalism and experience, I thought this is crazy to try and do this by myself. So I did everything up to, I guess, what was then Reba Stage C, which was um, design um, up to the point of construction drawings. Um, went in for a formal planning application and from C onwards, I took more of a backseat um, where I was, and actually they were very respectful of a young part two assistant. They came to me with every decision. They said, is it okay if we do this? Is it okay if we do that? Um, I owe those guys a debt of gratitude, mm. gratitude, comma, architects in Dublin. Um, so we together we built it. Um, and then there was me thinking I'd have to knock on Hopkins' door again. <laughs> so, okay, I've built my competition. Can I come back and have my old job back? Yeah. But that's when I realized the power of the media. The, mm. the project got published in various design magazines um, and the phone started ringing. Oh, you've done this in Dublin. Can you do this in London? Can you do this in, uh, we've had some European queries. And I think people were quite shocked when they phoned up and realized it was my mobile phone 
and there is no staff and it's just me. Yeah. Um, and what, what sorts of projects were those initial ones? They were everything, because the project was quite sculptural, it was like some public art projects. There was some um, general high-level design for um, yeah public spaces, really. Um, but I think that was the point where I thought, okay, there are some projects coming in, but they were very much on the long finger. Mm. So how do I keep myself afloat? How do I pay rent and pay my bills? And I had completely squandered the um, the fee for that project, mm. for the initial design or competition project. I bought computers. I got insurance. Um, I was very happy to do so because I knew I needed this infrastructure to start my company. Um, and from that, I just started doing house extensions. Right. Someone real like some people I know, friends of friends, realized I had now my own business. By the way, my auntie is doing a, a house extension. Can you do it? So I juggled quite a few house extensions in my first year post competition. Um, but then I realized that I wanted to do something slightly bigger. So we got introduced to a, a bar and restaurant group who wanted to do outdoor pop up uh, rooftop things around London. And they were quite ambitious, quite a young, young client with lots of aspirations, lots of ambitions, but probably not a huge knowledge of planning legislation or yeah. what's actually possible. So they came to me and because I kind of tended to be on the more artistic side, rather than just say, okay, I can do a planning application for a rooftop, I got carried away and designed and did 3D modeling and illustrations and CGIs. And they're like, okay, so I got to really design it. And the nature of a pop-up is such that you can do quite a few in one year. Yes, and they're quite fast turnover. Fast turnover, um, not as rigorous as a very detailed building, but ironically, probably seen more more times and visited by a bigger audience than a very detailed thought about small house, for instance. Um, so we did, because this client actually was rolling out these rooftop pop-ups, in one year, I'd say we, we bashed out five rooftops. Brilliant. Which are still, I think, the most visited summer pop-ups in London. Um, so actually, our reputation garnered quite a large audience. And people were actually Googling who designed this. And from that... We, we Which got, kind of pop-ups? Which ones were they? Uh, we've done Pergola on the Roof above the old BBC building in right. White City. We've done Pergola Paddington, which is in the Paddington Basin. And we've done the Prince at West Brompton, which was knocking through four Victorian houses and a really old pub out to a rear secret garden. So we knocked all the gardens together wow. of these old houses. And it became like a very kind of Enid Blyton kind of secret garden type thing. So... Each of the houses became a, its own restaurant uh, adjacent to a pub, which was the pub, the drinks offering. And then in summer, you had this outdoor secret garden. So that was a lot of fun to do with, I think, really good clients. They mm. they respected our um, ideas and they built them. And I think in our defense, their projects went are going still going very well. Yeah. And I think that mutual trust really worked. And so you've been sort of balancing these kind of more creative temporary projects with yeah. doing the more traditional residential yes. types of projects. Yeah. And then we're inside of this trampoline park, yeah. which is <laughs> I this is the first architect I think I've ever spoken with who runs and operates a trampoline park as well as your architecture practice. So how did that come about? That's Um that's an interesting one. So we're we're currently inside a 100-year-old theater. Right. That's been re that's been empty for ten years. Um, excuse me. They, the the theater itself has just been, it's been a victim of squatters. Um, so the owner of the building has approached us and said, "Hey, you guys do pop ups. Any ideas what to do in this huge building?" So our initial reaction was, "Well, it's it's got a huge ceiling height, so maybe climbing walls would be a really cool and fun." And actually, part of my reasoning for starting my own business was I want to do fun projects. Yeah. I don't want to do boring projects. If I, if I was doing boring projects, I'd just go get a job in a boring firm yeah. and get paid on time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, my mission with this whole Zap thing is to have fun, be creative and get paid. Yeah. So we got approached by the building owner and said, hey, um, any ideas? So we exhausted climbing walls. They're quite difficult to make profit because you need so many lifeguards per per visitor right um so the staff costs are quite high and then we looked at trampoline parks which actually were quite had quite a high revenue stream right um we did our research um and i say we it was mostly me i i visited other trampoline parks spoke to the owners and so not 
So when I came back to the owner of this building, I said, here's a full-on proposal document. And again, went to town with CGI's illustrations. This is how amazing it could look. Because I, I think one thing I've learned is you can't assume people have imagination. Mm. I think you have to show them what, what you mean. So this was unpaid. We weren't appointed to do anything. This was just me saying, what do you think? Which you could argue is terrible business. Mm. Well, that would that be, be my next question. How do you balance... How do you kind of personally balance like the speculative projects and work that you're going to be doing for free against the final returns? I think it? three years later, much more carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I was very much, I'm gambling here. Yeah. Um, and I guess we did a lot of competitions. The chance of winning a competition published in the UK design magazines is very slim. I think there's much more chance of having a space that's empty mm. and saying to a client, look, you put in the same effort as a competition. But what you don't do in a competition generally is come up with a business plan also. And that's what I did. I I projected the profits of a trampoline park in Stratford in East London and said, look, if you do this, th this is what you might get in return. And actually that sort of um, confidence made the clients trust me. And from that point, they said, let's go for it. By the way, you need to get all the investment. Off you go. So then... And how much was that? It was a substantial amount of money. It was, I guess, over half a million pounds. Right. Um, so you were the prime person responsible for facilitating the funds yes. to come into the project. Yes. So I partnered with an investor right. who I'd happened to be working on on a house extension. Um, there was a lot of trust and we actually got on very well. So we are now both co-directors of this trampoline park. Um, and it's been quite a fun adventure, kind of figuring out how to manage and run a trampoline park. Um, not like architecture at all. Um, this, the staff role here could be anything up to 30, 40 staff, um, all local kids, all usually in their first job. So we had a real social agenda here that we give 10,000 free hours of trampolining or bouncing to local school kids. Um, we only employ, employ local kids from the area on the London living wage. Right. Um, so I also use this as a bit of a societal example of what you can do with an empty building while people are also making profit. And is it and is it a permanent fixture here? No, it's it's termed meanwhile use, um, and our our lease is, of the building is about three years. Right. Yeah. So after the three years, um, we're not sure where this goes or what happens. Um, but right now, it's been quite a fun adventure, um, and it's going strong. It's doing very well. And and your advice to because obviously we were talking earlier about lots of architects have great ideas for bits of site or bits of disused land, and yeah. something that comes up again and again in conversations. And you're very much an advocate for like, well, get the business aspects of it right first, because then you can start making yeah. proposals. And you've won some other projects like that. We you? have. And I think I've got, like yourself, we've got a lot of architectural friends. Um, they often have great ideas for empty sites, but mm. it, it stops over a pint in a pub when they talk about the idea. Whereas I generally go a step further. Yeah. I do some kind of fag packet calculations. Um, okay, if we build this, it would probably cost this. And that's when I would actually find out who owns the land and say, look, we've had a proposal and I might do two days of massing models for free. And I'd probably max out with two days free work. I wouldn't speculatively do, go over one or two days. Right. And I would always make sure it's me that does it. So there's no staff cost. Right, okay. So I'm not paying anyone to do the speculative work. It's just me in my free time. Okay, so you've got control over it that yeah. way. Yeah, and... I have knocked on doors and people, they first they're like, who the hell are you? <laughs> and then they're like, well, actually, I've had this land for quite some time. And do you know anyone who would pay for this? So I then become a facilitator. I'd find someone who's willing to invest in this, for instance, like three or four apartments on this empty side. Mm. And they and so then you enter a JV with this client. So you're actually partnering up the investor with the client. Right. So initially, you've got the architecture work where you've got your architectural fee. And I think if you're more ambitious, you could maybe get involved in a slice of the pie of the of the project in itself. Um, thus far, we've been quite nervous to do that because I think it's difficult enough to just manage an architectural project mm. with an architectural fee. Um, but I think that's where it could lead to where we're actually stakeholders in, in the entire project. So actually had a kind of gaining a residual income from... a apartments that have been rented or actually having a, a final stake in equity of the development. Exactly, yes. And I think our role is planting the seed with the landowner 
finding the investor, which actually, much like the trampoline park, if the business plan is sound, it's actually not that difficult to find an investor. Right. But you need to do the work to prove that it is a sound business plan, um, which a lot of our, I think architects stop at that initial idea. They don't take it any further. And I think that's where we maybe need to grow some balls and diversify. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to to say, okay, um, we all we do the design, but we're also not stupid. We know that the investor and the landowner and the client are doing this for financial gain. And don't be ashamed of that. Because I think a lot of architects, when they hear money, they think it's a dirty word. Yeah. They think it's it's something to be ashamed of. And there's this struggling artist mentality that you should struggle and... And oh, by the way, a pop up on an empty rooftop is not real architecture. Or um, I get quite insulted when I hear a lot of my friends or acquaintances say, "Well, oh yeah, we're working in a big company doing real architecture. You're doing colourful pop ups in two months." Um, I would say hiding behind a HR department and an accountancy department and being quite far down the food chain, I'd question whether that's the same amount of design and architecture as actually building these pop-ups, um, yeah. going to this to B&Q or screw fix and actually buying fixings and even designing the music playlist for the opening night, yeah. designing the furniture, getting the furniture fabricated. Um, I would argue that's equally as much design as being on a four-year infrastructure project in a large mm. company. Um, saying that, we do do the colourful pop-ups, but we also do the the really serious, rigorous architecture projects. Yeah. Um, we balance both, and I don't think you have to limit yourself to one or the other. I think you can have fun, but you can also be a very rigorous architect. And which do you prefer? Which? I think each has a time and a place. Um, I mean, you meet some clients and they turn up with a back-to-front baseball cap, mm. and they're much younger than me, and you think, right, this isn't going to be an O'Donnell to me, Niall McLaughlin <laughs> church. <laughs> this is going to be a, this is going to be a colourful pop art installation. Mm. That's fine. It's fun. It's really good fun. And ironically, probably pays more than the really thoughtful two-year project. Right. Um, so you become a set designer or a kind of a, a window display. And don't forget, we live in the Instagram generation where most new money, new clients want to have a venue that's Instagrammable. Yes. Um, and that they don't Instagram details of staircases. They Instagram the colors and the brightness I think Sketch in London, the restaurants in central London, it's got the most Instagram toilets in the world. It's these uh, bathroom pods. And I, actually, I always think of that every time I start a design project because mm. that's often what these new clients well, that, want. That's, that's very interesting as well. That's kind of a very niche understanding of how modern marketing works yeah. and how lots of clients who are coming, who actually, they, they need to have buildings and spaces that are photographic and can be easily shared and we kind of might sort of dismiss it as being something uh, surface and frivolous but actually it, it's a real big driver for the success of these kinds of projects it is it is and i mean we all know those uh, social media um kind of duck lips pouting <laughs> you think well there's there's nothing behind that mm. there's, there's no and I, th I think architects they, they fancy themselves as intellectuals a lot of the time mm. and, and that superficial um, facade treatment. I, I get the point that where's the rigorous architecture behind that, but I'm trying to balance both. Mm. We're trying to create something that spatially works on cost, on budget, but also takes a bloody good photograph at the end. Yeah. Because um, the marketing of our projects has gone far and wide from mm. our pop-ups. And I've, I've actually, being honest, I've put more time and effort into one-off houses that no one will ever see. Mm. Um, so then it's about, is that self-gratification? Is it, does it matter if nobody sees it? If, if it's kind of, a, if a tree falls in the woods, like, <laughs> does, does it matter? And act, actually... Well, that, that, that's, very, that's very interesting because some of these, you know, the, the world of residential has lots of interesting challenges. Um, and one of them is the fact that sometimes a client does demand a lot of privacy around their house. And I mean, yeah. I've been requested before not to publicize photographs of a house. And you're like, oh, yeah. please. Really want like, to. I really, really, really want yeah. to do that. Because yeah. that's kind of... And so, again, those are kind of negotiations that you can end up having. But also, it is quite important for us to be able to have our work seen out there. And also, it's very different. It's a different kettle of fish from a residential client to a client who's business to business or their project is about driving a new audience to a yes. project. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I actually I see that as a massive asset with a young company like Zap. Yeah. Our average age is 27. Right. Within this company, um, within the office we have about six staff, and I'm the oldest by far, and I'm 34. Um, the, everyone else brings the age right down, so the average age is about 27. Um, our niche is that we're modern. We we understand social media. We and I don't think a lot of established practices do do that. Um, and I think that could be the key to winning business in the future. Mm. Um, advertising your pro- your project, and we talked about services, maybe maybe becoming a product. Yes. And that product might be the photograph or the the media following. So actually, what you're selling is a media following. Yeah. Or a brand. Yeah. And people are coming to us now to do pop ups because they've seen photographs of other pop ups. Um, I would I would argue that's our product. Um, in a, and I don't think anyone's really doing that with mm. with Gusto. And 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 what would you say about working with the right types of people? What kind of? Cause I know you were sharing with me earlier some yeah. you know some of the stories that you've oh, had yeah, don't, recently. Don't, but, it's not all it's not all glamour and Instagram. It's yeah. <laughs> it's we've been burned many many times. Um, yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm bald right now. It's, <laughs> it's we've we've been yeah we've we've had some serious long projects that haven't paid, like just haven't paid, and then they also knew that we didn't have the financial backing to go to court or to to fight the case. And mm. um, we've worked with clients that have gone into liquidation. Um, we've because we're young, you get very clever older clients who try to bully you mm-hmm. and push you around because they, they're probably quite aware it's your first big project or your first. So we've we've had to learn the hard way, I think. And as the only kind of uh, director of Zap Architecture, I've had to deal with the consequences of all of this. Mm. Um, I think I've learned a lot in three years. I never see any of it as a bad thing. I think it's all learning. Well, um, what, would you, what would you say have been the biggest, the biggest lesson that you've learned in the last few years of running Zap? I think choose your clients which telling a startup practice to choose their clients seems ludicrous. Yes. Because for the first three years, you say yes to everything. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Every, like just something that will allow me to go to a festival with my friends next summer. I just need some sort of fee <laughs> that, that will allow me to do this. I need to pay my insurance. I need to pay my rent. I need to pay my REBA registration, mm-hmm. um, my ARB registration. Pay for the computer. Pay for the computers, yeah. And you say yes to everything. But I found out a good project that seems to have a large fee if it doesn't pay, like you've just sold out maybe a year of your time mm-hmm. and maybe a year of your staff's time. So I'd actually really, I trust my gut a lot more when I meet a client for the first time. If they seem like they're trying to take advantage, they probably are, I think. If, if you get that feeling from, from day one. How, how can you screen clients? This is, again, this is a kind of reoccurring theme. I mean, I'm, I was chatting to uh, Wendy Pairing of Pad Studio and she was mm. saying, Kind of tongue in cheek, but there was a there was a seriousness to her her comment about how that she would like to have some sort of psychological profiling before yeah, yeah. any any yeah. clients. And I think we forget that the nature of any architectural project is a long relationship mm. generally. Yeah. And when it goes wrong, it really can go wrong. Yeah, it can. Um, and I've been on the receiving end of that. Mm. Um, yeah, and I. I think burning your bridges in architecture is the worst thing you can do. Mm. Like what we worked together 10 years ago. Yeah. And we just worked in a big office. We, we hung out after work. It's amazing how things come back mm. and who you meet in the future as a result of things you've done. Um, even a city like London is not that big. I mean, you tend to know the same people and the clients tend to know the same people. Yes. Um, so I, I would never, we pride ourselves in being very honest and not burning bridges. Um, if a client wants to do that, I think I've got a philosophy now, like let them do that, but we don't want to be involved. Um, in terms of profiling, I do the obvious stuff, check on companies' house, see if they've got a record for liquidating companies. Or, mm. But clever people can sidestep all of that. And it's at that point, I think it's all about your um, your judge of character. Yeah. Um, and I do listen to my gut a lot now. Yeah. Um, I, I might go for dinner with them before we start the project, have a good chat with them. Um, and recently there's been projects where the fee was good, but I decided it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Um, and we've now got some really good clients because of that. So And, and that can be qu- uh, such a difficult thing for a young practice to do, is yeah, to yeah. turn a project down because it doesn't feel right or there's something yeah. about it. But it's actually... I think, you know, you're saying with, with the experience of when it does when it doesn't work out, yeah. the amount that it can end up costing emotionally, financially, yeah. stress, 
quality of life, yeah. actually getting it right from the outset is... Yeah, we were in arrears with the printing company about a year ago. Right. And at the very same moment, a huge job came in that would have just crossed out the, the debt to the printing company. And I made the decision not to take the project. And because we're such a small office and we share everything, I told the, I told the staff, and they're like, are you crazy? Like, we need to get rid of this. We need, we need to print again. <laughs> um, and I said, no, just give it a week or two. There'll be other projects. And yeah, two weeks later, we got another large project and we cleared our printing debt and we overpaid and bought them a, a, some flowers and a box of chocolates. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, you, you have to make quite tough decisions. Mm. And I, I do think trusting your gut after being burned a few times is something, it's quite hard to quantify, but it's something I, I believe in. Mm. And so what's yeah. next? What's next for, for Zap? Um, we've come back in 2019 with a real aggressive, let's win some work. Yeah. Um, Zap have delivered 45 projects since their inception. Um, not all of these are building projects. That's in the last, in the last three years, in the 40, last three 45 years. projects. Some of them are window displays. Yeah. Some of them are installations in shopping malls. Um, so they're not all huge projects and some of them are one week projects. Mm. But up until this year, I've won every single project personally. Mm. We have an office of six people. Mm -hmm. So I came back in January and I said, guys, come on, why am I winning every project? Because often I'm winning these projects to pay your salary. Yeah. And I had a slight um, bitterness in my voice. Yes. If I'm being honest, it's like, wh why aren't you guys doing it? So one conversation, they off all the, they all went off and started emailing prospective clients, respective clients. In the last month, they've won four projects. Wow. Without me. That's, that's part two assistance, part one assistance. Um, and I kind of thought, so I've asked them, why didn't you do this before? And they said, well, no one ever communicated this to us. So it's my fault. It's not their fault. Yeah. All I had to say was like, guys, can we, can we send three emails a week each? Um, do it in your lunch break. And, that, and that's really interesting as well, because this is one of these things that you could have just sat on that and then gotten annoyed and angry. Yeah. But they were never to know. They, it, yeah, I'm not a passive aggressive person, but I could feel myself getting a bit like, why am I winning every bloody project? Yeah. Um, and they've done it very well. And actually to instill confidence and reward, they get a finder's fee right. on a new project. Great. So it's financially worth their while. And I also let them deal with the follow through. They become the point of contact on that particular project. And I think that instills a confidence in a very young part one or a young part two mm. that actually they've won a job. They've, they've got client trust and they've brought it into the practice. Mm. And okay, at a certain level, I'll have to get involved and kind of reassure the client that we're the real deal. But um, it's lovely to see it, actually. It's really satisfying to see that. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of breeding a culture of entrepreneurs. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sort of entrepreneurial mindset but within within their own company. Yeah. And it's, I mean, yeah, it's, I'm learning. It's about delegating. It's about yeah. sharing what I do with very responsible people. Yeah. Brilliant. And so, and also you were saying you've, you've just won some TFL projects. Yeah, we're doing a TFL project um, in central London. Um, and we've just done a Thames water project uh, on the Thames water and um, sewage treatment works. So when you start going from Mr. and Mrs. Smith's house extension to projects with these institutions, I think the game ups considerably. Mm. It also becomes much more professional in a good way where you're not dealing with Mr. and Mrs. Smith saying, oh, we want to pay your fees, but we've just had a baby and we can't pay your fees. And I'm like, well, why did you appoint us six months ago or nine months ago, probably? Um, so, yeah, working with institutions is where I want to be. Um, more set design companies. I mean, set designers are really respected. They get paid what, they, what the hours they work. Mm -hmm. Architects could learn a lot from set designers. Um, the work is the same. It's usually a SketchUp model, a CAD plan. But a, uh, a set designer often doesn't need to think about planning permission, building regulations, but they've garnered respect within their industry. Um, we're actually attacking quite a few, not so much architecture jobs, but installations, set designs, window displays, because the fees are much better. Yeah. And it's enjoyable. It's really fun work. Yeah. Photographs well. Brilliant. Going back to the Instagram thing. And it kind of feeds that marketing. Yeah agenda as well of your of your yeah. own business i think right? architects could learn a lot from set designers mm. what um, would what would be the sort of one takeaway you would say that an architect could learn from set designers um they if they think the fee is not worth it they just won't do it they won't and they charge for every single hour they work um and the companies they work with respect that mm. it's usually advertising and marketing companies so maybe possibly 
I mean, I was about to say just now that the bur- budgets are bigger, but they're not. The budgets on a construction jobs are huge. Like, so why can't we take that slice of the construction mm. job budget? It's because we've undersold ourselves and we undercut ourselves, yeah. um, which set designers don't seem to do. So I have a lot of appreciation for th- and I, we hang around with a lot of set designers, fashion designers, movie makers, because um, I think that's important to cultivate kind of cross fertilization, especially because we want to stay young and fluid and a bit more fun, I guess. Brilliant. Yeah. Paul, thank you so much. That is a, a real, you know, whirlwind tour of what you guys have been doing at Zap and some really exciting work. So thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.